before Baal Safan. Baal Safan, by the way, was the god of Egypt that they thought was in charge of the seas and the storms. And you'll see hopefully why that's important. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us so, to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For, what, 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 for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. As we come to our story today, we find that the children of Israel have an on-charging Egyptian army behind them and a Red Sea before them. They are stuck between a rock and a hard spot. They're in what I call a tight place. Has anybody ever been in a tight place before? Perhaps you're in a tight place because maybe your marriage is on the verge of divorce and you have young kids and you don't want to hurt them and you find yourself in a tight place. Or maybe your boss has asked you to do something that compromises your integrity, but you feel if you don't, your job is on the line and so you're in a tight place. Maybe you have too much month at the end of the money and so you're in a tight place. Maybe the diagnosis came back and it's not real good and so you're in a tight place. Maybe the addiction you thought you conquered has reared its ugly head again and you're in a tight place. Maybe you're dating somebody that you think you love but you know the relationship is wrong and so you're in a tight place place. Maybe you got saved and all your friends didn't, so they're still doing and going places that you shouldn't be going and doing things you shouldn't be doing, and the peer pressure is mounting up, and so you're in a tight place. We all find ourselves in tight places from time to time, and today, what I want to talk to you about, what I feel my assignment is today, is to minister to you on the subject of the God of my tight places. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you speak to our hearts like only you can. You know how to take words and minister life to each person in their area of need. That's my prayer today. I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, you may be seated. God has raised up Moses, a very unlikely leader. He's insecure. He stutters. He's even committed murder. But he's the one God has selected to lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian slavery, which they've been in for 400 years. And when you look at the selection of Moses, you've got to kind of scratch your head a little bit. But God chooses unlikely people to do extraordinary things. And that's why we all ought to be excited about that because nobody is perfect enough to be chosen. Can I get a good amen? But yet God still uses us in our imperfections to do amazing things. And he, he chooses Moses. And you know the story. We looked at it last time. He appears to Mo Moses in a burning bush and puts Moses back into the ministry. And Moses is now realizing that he can still be used. And he gives him this one little phrase to bring before Pharaoh, let my people go. And so Moses goes into Pharaoh and he says that one thing, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And Moses turns around and walks out. It's kind of comical. He goes back the next thing. He, he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And Moses walks out. And he does this day after day after day until finally Moses gets a little fed up and he adds this one little phrase. He goes, Jehovah has said, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh goes, uh, still no. Because you got to understand the Egyptians were polytheistic, which means they had many, many gods. They had gods for everything. The God of the sun, the God of the moon, the God of the stars, the God of the plants, the God of the bugs, the God of the ocean, God of the animals, gods of everything. And so when, when Moses goes into Pharaoh and says, Jehovah has said, Pharaoh's response is, who is this God that I should obey him? Who's this puny little God? I mean, there's so many gods out there. Why should, I, why should I regard your God? And so because he challenged who God was, how many of you know you never need to defend God? God can defend himself all by himself, right? And because he challenged God, God gives Pharaoh this little audiovisual presentation to prove who he is in the form of ten plagues. Do you remember that? And so he gives these ten plagues, and the last plague is the death of all of the firstborn uh, children in all of Egypt. People think, man, that's harsh and everything, and it is. But remember, Pharaoh is the one who sowed for that. Remember what he did to the Hebrew children. 
He issued an edict that every firstborn Hebrew male child be thrown into the crocodile-infested Nile River. Moses should have died in the crocodile-infested Nile River, but he lived because God's hand was on him. And so now Pharaoh is reaping what he's sown in his life. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. And so now God sends this last plague, and sure enough, he's got Pharaoh's attention. And Pharaoh says to Moses, he calls him in. He says, okay, you win. Get out of here. And Moses said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. You could have did it on the first plague, the second plague, the third plague, the fourth plague, the fifth plague, the sixth plague, the seventh plague. You didn't have to wait until this happened. How many of you know sometimes if we'll just obey God, we'll avoid a whole lot of consequences. Have you ever looked back on your life and go, I wish I would have obeyed sooner, you know? Because the fact of the matter is that God is going to keep on you and keep on you and keep on you and keep on you and keep on you until you finally obey. So you might as well just obey because it's going to get harder to obey if you wait to obey. And so finally, he lets him go and he realizes he's not serving just an ordinary God. He realized this God is a little bit different. This God can use the flies and the frogs as part of his army. This God can turn the water supply off on the earth at a whim. This God God can give life to the cattle and can take it away. This God can speak to their rivers and turn them into blood. This God can turn the light on in the universe and on the earth, turn the sun on and off like it's hooked up to a switch on the wall. This God can use locusts and turn them into lions. This God can cause hell to rain down from heaven. This God can send a plague on a place and still protect his people in that same place. He realizes this God is God all by himself. So he says, go ahead. Go. And so Moses begins leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And this is not a quick exodus. This is a mass exodus. This is three million people moving from one place to another place. Anybody ever try to get out of here after church? There's a little bit of a traffic jam, right? I mean, I, I don't ever see it because I leave probably like a half an hour after it's over. But I mean, the line and you got to wait to get up and it takes a long time and it can be dis- Imagine being part of three million people moving to the same place. And it's estimated that the last person in line would take 24 hours to pass where the first person began in the line. I'm glad that wasn't a buffet line that I was on, right? Imagine if that was a buffet line, you're way in the back there. And, I mean, this is what is going on. They are moving slowly and they are progressing toward their promised land. And as they are progressing, they're headed east. God is going to give them some waterfront views on their way. He heads down. He heads them toward the Red Sea. And as they get to the Red Sea, they realize that they're stopping there. They have nowhere else to progress. And they think, well, maybe we can go back and retrace our steps. And they look back and in back of them is the on-charging Egyptian army. And in front of them is the Red Sea. And they are caught between the that rock in a hard place, they are again in a tight spot. So the question is, what do we do when we find ourselves in a tight spot? Number one on your outline, you trust the plan. You trust the plan. Look at verse number 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country. That was the easy way. He didn't lead them on that road, though it was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. God led them the long way instead of the short way. How many has ever been led by God the long way? How many has ever been led by God in such a way and you're like, God, I don't understand why it's taking me so long. I don't understand why you just can't get me there sooner. God, I don't understand why you just can't get me the shortest distance between two places is a straight line. Lead me on the straight line. God, it seems like I'm just going over here and then making a turn over there. It's been a long time, God. How many of you know when God leads you the long way instead of the short way, it's still the best way? How many of you know that God has surveyed the situation? He's, he's looked at the details from the beginning to the end. Matter of fact, God starts at the end, we know, and he backs up to the beginning. And so when God leads you a certain way, you can have confidence that God has already taken into consideration all the obstacles and all of the maneuvers of the enemy, and God has led you the best way. God's plan is always the best way. God knew Pharaoh was coming after them, no matter which way they went. And if they went the shortest way, it would have been the dead way. Can I tell you that the speed at which you arrive at a place is not the most important thing? 
Getting something for the sake of having something is not the most important thing. The way you get there is more important than the speed at which you get it. You didn't hear that. Because we live in a time where we, if we want it, we, we want it now. And if we don't get it now, we figure out a way to get it faster. And sometimes the ways that we figure out to get it faster are ways that are not the right way. They're ways that wind up causing us to compromise. They're ways that wind up causing us or leading to spiritual death. If they would have went the short way, they would have got caught out in the open by the on-charging Egyptian army. And if they were caught out there, they would have been ha they would have had to fight a war that they couldn't win. How many of you know when God leads you a certain way, most of the time he's trying to avoid you getting into wars and fighting fights that you can't win. And the problem with us is that when we go our own way, we get into circumstances that we were never meant to go up against. And those circumstances sometimes kick our rear end because we weren't meant to fight those fights. But when God leads you a certain way, and when you are on the path that God has for you, any fight on that path, you are capable of winning. And so he leads them, not the long way, but the short way, because he's got a plan. And God's plan is always better. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a bright future and an expected end. God's way is the best way because he's already seen what your enemy is going to do. And he's already factored it in so that you can overcome the obstacle that is in your way. God's way is the best way. The reason why you can trust the plan of God is because the plan of God also has a path out. Matter of fact, the word exodus, do you know what it means? It means a way out. I think it's extraordinary that God puts an entire book in the Bible called a way out. Do you know why I think God put an entire book in the Bible called a way out? Because so many times you and I get involved in circumstances where we believe there's no way out. And so God said, I need to deal with this, this issue that humanity has, this, this feeling of stuck that humanity has. And I need to put a whole book, 66 books in the Bible, and an entire book to a way out. I'm here to tell somebody today, no matter what kind of tight space you're in, God has already got a way out. There is a path for you to get out of whatever tight space you're in. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse number 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out that you can endure it. See, when you follow God's plan, there's always a ram caught in a thicket. When you follow God's plan, there's always ravens that are commanded to give you bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. When you follow God's plan, there's always a widow at Zarephath waiting to sustain you. When you follow God's plan, there's always water in your desert and a, and a road through your ocean. When you follow God's plan, there's always a way out. Psalm 77 verse 16 of the Red Sea says this, When the Red Sea saw you, O God... Its waters looked and trembled. The sea quaked to its very depths. The clouds poured down like rain. The thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your road led through the sea. Your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. Moses didn't know there was a pathway through the Red Sea. Pharaoh didn't know that there was a pathway through the Red Sea. The Egyptians didn't know there was a pathway through the Red Sea. The, the East Israelites didn't know there was a pathway through the Red Sea. But there was one person who knew there was a pathway. There was one person who knew there was a way out. And he was God. And so even though it looked like God was leading them to a dead end, God was leading them to the place where the path was for them to get out of their place of slavery and walk into their promised land. There is is a path. There is a way out. It's been put there before your problem ever existed. Do you know they did a topography study of the ocean floor of the Red Sea? It says you can look it up. You can Google it. And they found out that it, it's, it's really low on one side. And then about midway through, it comes up like this. And then there's a little shelf. And then it goes down like this. And then it gets real low again. Actually, a topography done of it. Guess who put that there? God. Guess why God put that there? He put that there. 
millennial before the children of Israel arrived there because he knew that one day the children of Israel, his children, would need that path in order to walk out of their problem and enter into their promise. And I'm here to tell somebody this morning, I don't know who I'm preaching to right now, but I know this, that before you even knew that you had a problem, God millennia ago, God millions of years ago, set a path in place for you to walk through your ocean on dry ground. You can trust the plan of God because there's a path. Not only is there a path, but the plan also has a purpose. And that's why you can trust it. Exodus chapter number 14, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by the place that we can't pronounce. Between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore, across from Baal Safan. Then Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory. I have planned this in order to display my glory. You thought that the plan was arbitrary. You thought God came up with the plan uh, on the fly. You thought when you had the problem, God devised the plan. But according to this verse, God planned this for a specific purpose. And the purpose that God planned this was in order to display his glory. And here's why we can trust the plan. Because there is a purpose in the plan. And here's the purpose that most of us don't get too excited about. But I think we ought to get excited about it. The plan is for God to get some glory from our story. See, our plan is just to get victory, and we don't give a rip where the glory is brought to God, but God's plan is to give you victory, and on your way to victory, for him to get glory, because victory without glory going to God is a charlatan and a sham victory. It's nothing that will secure your faith, but when God steps in, and when God is put on display, and when God's hand shows up, and God gets glory, all of a sudden your story takes on different meaning. And I believe there are some people who ought to get comfortable with God getting some glory from your story. The plan has a path. The plan has a purpose. Trust the plan. Don't alter the plan. Don't follow your own plan. Don't take part of the plan and devise your own part of the plan. Don't take God's start and put your finish on it. Don't don't, don't put your start on it and God's finish on it. Go with the plan. Don't alter it. Stick to it. Whatever he says, obey it. Do what God says. God's not trying to trick you. God is trying to take you out of whatever tight spot that you're in. What do I do when I'm in a tight spot, spot, pastor? Number two, you take a step of faith. Children of Israel uh, are moving toward the Red Sea. God is not leading them the shortest way, but he's leading them the best way. But in order for them to see God's plan fully come to pass, God says this, verse number 13. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so that the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am God. Does this verse confuse anybody else? Moses says, stand still, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. God will fight for you. In other words, implication, you don't have to do anything. Then God speaks to Moses and said, why do you keep crying out to me? Tell the people, get moving. Moses says, stand still. God says, get moving. 
Moses says, stand still. God says, get moving. It almost seems like God and Moses are on a different page. And part of the reason why we never see a breakthrough in our life is because us and God are often not on the same page. We want to do things our way, and God is saying, you got to do things my way, and we're insisting on our way, and God is saying, no, my way, and we're saying, but God, my way is the shorter way, and God's saying, but my way is the best way. And in order to get a breakthrough, you got to get on the same page with God. But the truth of the matter is, Moses and God are on the same page. Because how many of you know that you can stand still and get moving at the same time? I said, how many of you know that you can stand still and get moving at the same time? Say, Pastor, how do I stand still and get moving at the same time? Stand still is an inside thing. Get moving is an outside thing. Stand still is the attitude. It's the rest of faith. And get moving is the step of faith. And in order to see the plan of God go into operation in your life, you both need the rest of faith and the step of faith. You got to believe that God will do what he promised. You got to believe that God will take you out. You got to believe that God has an answer. But believing it is only a part of the equation. You got to believe and you got to act in accordance with your belief because the stand still is the rest and the get moving is the step. Faith without works is dead. And see, here's part of the problem. Most of us want to take a step of faith after God shows up with his power. Most of us want power before we go. But God doesn't give you power before you go. God gives you power as you go. I call it the power along the way principle. The step of faith is that which enacts the power of God in your life. Look at what God says. He says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff. Raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle ground of the sea. And I will. Once you get going, once you start marching, once you stretch out your hand, once you put your staff over the waters, then I will. The implication is, and I won't, until you get moving. You got to take a step of faith. Power along the way. Power along the way. Here's what God was saying. Somewhere between here and there, my power will show up. Somewhere between, but we don't want it somewhere between here and, here and there. We want God, give me the power so I can get there. And God is saying, no, no, no. Somewhere between here and there, as you move, my power will show up. In order for the walls of Jericho to fall down, they had to march around those walls seven days. On the seventh day, seven times. And then give a shout. And then the walls fell. Power along the way. In order for them to cross over the Jordan River at flood stage, they had to step into the water while it was overflowing, and then God stopped the waters. In order for God to provide the widow woman with enough to make it through the famine, she was down to her last little bit of corn, her last little bit of oil. God didn't multiply that until after she gave Elijah some pancakes first. Power along the way. David went to the brook. He took five smooth stones. He put them in a shepherd's bag. He charged toward Goliath. He put the stone in the slingshot and after that God took the stone and made it into a guided missile power along the way. Bartimaeus was on the side of the road. Jesus knew he was blind. It wasn't until he shouted out and threw aside his garment that Jesus healed his blind eyes. Power along the way. You'll never be blessed in life until you first become a blessing. Give and it will be given to you. Power along the way. Bring the tithe and I will open up the windows of heaven. Power along the way. You cannot give Get God to move without a step of faith. It's a requirement. A requirement. What is your step of faith? I don't know. But here's what I do know. Whenever we are in a tight spot, God will always ask us to take a step of faith. Always. Because God wants to release his power but the law of faith says that in order for God to release his power, I've got to take a step of faith. You can't even get saved without taking a step of faith. 
That, that step of initial faith, when you give your life to Jesus, releases the power of God into your life. Take your step of faith. I just feel led of the Holy Spirit to share this story. I've shared it before with you. But we had a young uh, girl many, many years ago. She had an inoperable tumor on her liver. Inoperable. And we were praying and praying and praying. And the thing was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Until finally they said, man, the doctor said, we got to go in. We got to do something. But we think she might die on the operating table. Because we don't think we can save enough of the liver for it to regenerate itself. Well, the week before the operation, the parents, the offering went way up. Went up by like $100,000 that week. And so I said, why is the offering so big this week? And they said, Pastor, somebody gave $100,000 in offering. And I no normally don't ask this, but I was curious. I said, who? And they told me. So I called the people up and I offered to give them their money back. I said, I don't, I don't want you to, like, put in this big check to buy a miracle. I said, you know, I don't want you to be in that situation. And they said, Pastor, the Lord told us that's our step of faith. They said, we're not taking it back. I said, well, that's fine. I said, we'll receive it, but if you want it back, just say so. Well, they went in to do the operation a couple days later. They opened her up. They grabbed the tumor that was the size of a softball, and they tugged on it a little bit, and the entire tumor detached from the liver, just like that, boom. They weren't able to save 10% of the liver. They were able to save something like 70 or 80% of the liver. All you need is 20%. It'll regenerate. They were able to save like 70 or 80% of the liver. Then they opened up the tumor, and guess what they found out? That the thing had been completely dead from the inside out. They said this cancer wasn't going nowhere. It was contained. It was, it was dead. What? They st step of faith. Step of faith, step of faith, step of faith. I'm talking to somebody right now. I don't know what kind of situation and what kind of tight spot that you're in, but here's what I am telling you. You need to take a step of faith in order to release the promises of God. You need to not only have the rest of faith, but you need to take the step of faith. Get going. March, God said. Raise your rod toward the Red Sea. And then I will do it. What do I do, Pastor, when I'm in a tight spot? Number three, you turn down doubt. You turn down doubt. Moses has stretched his rod over the Red Sea. God is parting the Red Sea. And there is this little detail given at the beginning of the story, and then it changes a little bit at the end of the story. We could all relate to this. Watch this. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day, this is when they're first coming out of Egypt. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Here's what that means. As they were coming out, as they were freshly delivered from slavery, God was with them every moment of every day. God was with them all the time. They were seeing God in front of their face. They woke up in the morning. The first thing they saw was that cloud of smoke. They pe peeked up in the middle of the night and they saw that pillar of fire. God was with them every single step of the way as they were getting used to life outside of Egypt and life outside of being enslaved. And as they were getting used to walking through the wilderness, God was there every single step of the way. They saw his face the whole entire time. You remember those days when you first got saved? You pray a prayer and you'd automatically hear God lead you and direct you. You'd be like, oh, God is speaking to me. So you come to church and in the worship, man, you feel the presence of God. You get them goosebumps and stuff like that. You'd be like, oh, man, that was so awesome. That was incredible. Pastor, why is the service only an hour and 15 or an hour and 30 minutes? Can't it go a little bit longer, Pastor? When are we having church again, Pastor? And then you've been saved for a little while. You're like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you're preaching a little long today, Pastor. You know, you better cut this thing right here short. I got some things I got to do. You get into worship, instead of feeling the presence of God, music is loud. I, I could say a lot about that, but I'm not going to because I'm going to take it easy on you right now. But, but somewhere, 
between then and between. God was always there. You pray a prayer, God answer that prayer. I mean, you'd be like, oh, I need some money. You go into the, to the mailbox. You open up the mailbox. There's an unexpected check in the mail. I like this God relationship. This God relationship is good. God is here for me. When I need him, I call on him. God shows up. I like this God. I can deal with this relationship where whenever I need you, I call you and you show up. You're like my little waiter, God. I like that relationship. God was there the whole time. But now... They are about to enter into the Red Sea. They're about to step onto the dry ground. And as they're about to step onto the dry ground, as they are on the last phase of their deliverance, Exodus 14, verse 19 says, And the angel of the Lord, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Has God ever moved on you? Has God ever gone from where you can see him every moment and every second and you could feel him and you could hear him and, 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 and you can sense him and, 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 and everything is going good to all of a sudden everything has gone dark and you come to church and you try to get your praise on but you're dry inside. You pray some prayers. And instead of feeling like God has answered the prayers, you feel like your prayers are going nowhere. You expect God to show up on a certain time, and he doesn't. Has God ever disappeared on anybody? And when God disappears on you, you're tempted to say, oh, he doesn't care. He, I don't know why he left me now when I, when I needed him the most. But can I just submit something for your spiritual consideration God can't be seen, not because he has abandoned you, not because he has decided he doesn't want to talk to you, but because God has moved to a better place in your life. God has moved to the place where you need him more. You no longer need him, even though I know you think you need him where you can see him, but now you need him in a place where you can't see him anymore. Now you need him to watch your back because when you're on the fringe of your deliverance, there's an enemy charging after you. And what he wants to do is he wants to pull you back right when you're on the cusp. And so you need a God that's not in front of you. You need a God that shifts and moves behind you and gets in between you and the enemy so he can't suck a punch you and pull you back to the place that you have been delivered from. And so God moves because God's got our back. God's got your rear side covered. Then I read some of the story and it said, the children of Israel, when they got to the other side, they looked back and they saw that the wheels on the chariots of the Egyptians were jammed. And I thought, I, I, I know, I know, I know. God, I got it. When I can't see you, when I think you've disappeared, I know what you're doing. I know. You're jamming the wheels of the enemy, ain't you? God, God, you're, you're slowing the enemy down, ain't you? When I, when I can't see, you slowed him up. I know he was coming hard, Lord, and, and if he came at that same speed, he probably would have got me because you know how you and I are. We don't always walk a straight pace, do we? We don't always walk without sl sometimes we stumble along the way and sometimes we take a step back. And so sometimes it's necessary for God to not be where we can see him, but to slip into the enemy's camp and begin to do a little wheel jamming on his plan so that he, he can't say, I'm preaching a whole lot better than y'all all are responding today. God sometimes moves behind. And so here they are and they are getting ready to step into the parted Red Sea. And the Bible says this, Exodus chapter 14 verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night.
and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided so the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and a wall to them on their left hand and the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea all Pharaoh's horses his chariots and his horsemen do you know why the Egyptians pursued because they thought the Baal dude, the God of the sea, was on their side. They thought there was some other God in charge of the winds and the waves. And they didn't see Moses because they're three million deep. Where take his rod and go like this. They thought their God had opened. So they went in hard after him. They didn't know that their God wasn't the God that was in charge. But the God of the Israelites were in charge. But here's what I want you to see. For us, we think about this, and we've seen it in the movies with Charlton Heston and, you know, the amazing dramatic scene, you know, where Moses just forth the rod and the waters start to peel back like paper, you know, and, and it's amazing. And, and you can almost envision if you were there going, wow, our God is awesome. Our God is amazing. But you know how I think they felt? I ain't going in there. I mean, think about this. You got a water wall on your right and a water wall on your left. And you know water ain't supposed to stand up now. I mean, that's unusual for water to stand. If you see water standing up, you better check to make sure you ain't on nothing first. Because if water is standing up, and I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, I don't know if I'm going to step into that water. I got to cross that water. That water's got to be three mile journey from here to there. When is that water going to fall down on me? And I know I might risk it if I was first in line because you can get a running start and go. But if you're like three millionth in line or you got people in front of you, you know, I'd be like, I don't know if I'm stepping in right here. But then I thought about this. Why, God, did you create such a tight space for them to get through their promised land. God, you created a path that had a water wall on the right. And you created a path that had a water wall on the left. And you created a path that had an enemy charging from behind. God, why'd you create a path that was so tight? And then I read a scripture that said, wide is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to life. And all of a sudden I realized that God knows us better than we know us. Because remember what the Egyptians, uh, what the Israelites thought? They said to Moses, why did you bring us out here? We're going to die out here. There's no grace. It would have been better for us to go back. Do you know why God has a hard time delivering us? It's not because he can't part waters because he can. It's not because he can't walk on water because he can. It's not because he can't heal cancer because he can. It's not because of any of that. God has a hard time delivering us because what we have been trained to be, we always want to revert back to. Y'all didn't get that. See, they were slaves. 400 years they were trained to be slaves and so when the pressure of life came on their natural inclination was to revert back to what they were trained to be this is why when somebody is abused and there's a path out that they'll stick right with everybody who has never been abused is going well I don't understand why don't you just walk out of the situation? Trained, trained, trained. See, this is what the devil works. The devil will get a hold of your mind, start manipulating your mind because he knows that if he can keep you trapped up here, even when deliverance is in front of you, you'll have a tendency to retreat. This is why somebody who's been treated with contempt all of a sudden gets treated with love and they buck the love because they are expecting the contempt in their life this is why when somebody who's only had bad things happen to them in life all of a sudden have something good happen to them in life they'll start thinking what is the catch because their mind has become imprisoned and somebody said well why doesn't God do anything about that oh he does See, because God knows that left to our own devices, that there will be a tendency for us to go back. 
God knows when left to our own devices, there will be a tendency for us to move right. God knows when left to our own devices, there'll be a tendency for us to, to veer off to the left. And so here's what God does. God creates a pathway. Somebody ain't hearing me right now. You ought to already be shouting. God creates a pathway through the ocean, a pathway to the promised land. And there is no wiggle room. They can't move to the right because on the right there's a water wall. And they can't move to the left because on the left there's a water wall. And they can't go back because there's an enemy. So there's only one way for them to go. And that is toward their promised land. Somebody ought to thank God for your tight place. Somebody ought to thank God when there's no wiggle room, when all the options are off the table and the only option you have is to pursue the path that God has for your life. He is the God of our tight places. He is the God of our tight places. He is the 